affecting our youth today and providing services for much of our, many of our young people. And we're grateful to them for using their facilities. The series we've been uh, putting together focus on a number of international issues and we try to connect them to problems which exist here in the community because we don't believe that any distinction can and ought to be made between so-called international questions and local ones. Last week, for example, we had a panel on Somalia. It wasn't well attended, unfortunately, but we felt it was important to bring uh, people from Somalia into the community to discuss that problem, because we know there's a lot of confusion. A lot of people think that George Bush and Dan Quayle and Brent Scowcroft and Colin Powell and company have gone to Africa to free black people. So we thought it was important to get uh, first-hand information from people from Somalia. Today we want to look at the question of the destruction of black civilization, not just ancient, but particularly the destruction of our civilization today, the destruction of our people in a contemporary context especially when we see that people are under some sense of illusion that we are now embarking upon a new era, that freedom is in the air with the new administration and the incorporation of many black corporate leaders and so on, black lawyers into the administration. We thought we would invite those who have been studying the civilization of black people, both ancient as well as modern, to come together share ideas, which in turn, by the way, we uh, make available to people in other cities by putting it up on the satellite. So much of what happens here is generally heard in many other cities, because we feel that's the best way to try to uh, raise the consciousness of our people. We have with us today a number of people who uh, are most qualified to do that. Uh, Brother John Henry Clark, the stalwart, someone who has not hesitated on any occasion that we've called upon him to, uh, to, uh, to deal with these and other issues. But Brother Edward Scobie, similarly, is here with us, who has exhibited a similar enthusiasm. We will be joined uh, by Sister Rashida Ishmael Abu Bakar, who's a psychologist, a very good, very bright sister in our view. And, uh, Brother Basil Wilson, who's now the provost of John Jay College, will be coming here later on. And my name is Samori Maxman, and I should, I'll be trying to coordinate things for this afternoon. The focus, as I said today, is on the question of uh, the destruction of black civilization. And I won't um, take much of your time, in fact, very little time, by way of uh, introducing our first speaker. But I just want to say a couple of things by way of introduction. We, uh, many of us who consider ourselves to be progressive, particularly the so-called black nationalists, and especially the so-called black leftists, or black Marxists, whatever that is, or those of us who consider ourselves to be socialist-oriented, we, uh, we always talk about the great crisis in which capitalism finds itself. We're always talking about how America is in decline and Britain is in decline, and Europe is in decline. And I suppose I have to confess personally, it makes me feel good when I say that. But I'm afraid it doesn't jive with reality. It doesn't correspond to reality. When I look at the, the direction in which the world is going, I look at Ethiopia. I look at the political economy of Ethiopia. I look at the health and social services of Ethiopia. I see that Ethiopia is in decline. When I look at Somalia, and I look at similar institutions, I see Somalia is in the decline. When I look at Jamaica, I see that Jamaica is in decline. Whether you're talking about the proliferation of narcotics, whether you're talking about crime and violence, fratricidal violence, whether you're talking about the, 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 the sort of a retrograde economic program that is uh, existent there, when you, no matter what you talk about, we are in decline in these societies. In central Brooklyn, in Harlem, in south central Los Angeles, we are in decline. Haiti, if you look at the three oldest republics, two oldest republics, the one in the east, Liberia, the one in the west, Haiti, and you look at 
the world's longest existing nation state, Ethiopia. We are all pathetically in a state of decline today. It's not something that I am proud of saying. It's something very painful for me to, and I'm sure the others, to have to recognize. The question is, as we are on the threshold of the 21st century, are we in a position to arrest this decline and perhaps to begin to create structures to turn the situation around? 500 years after Columbus, what would, be year, what would year one after the first 500 be? Are we going to change the course of history and put ourselves back into control of our own destiny? That's the central issue we'd like to address here today. I know that many people are sort of excited, as I said, by the changes which are happening here in the United States. We look at people like Ron Brown, and we are proud. Uh, the, good set, the good congressman from Harlem, Mr. Charles Rangel, said that uh, it is great that, Ch that uh, Ron Brown represented the government of Haiti, because on, he represented the Duvalier government, and that did wonderful things for the people of Haiti. They think that Mr. Um, Vernon uh, Jordan is a wonderful man and is doing great things for the people of the United States, for African people, by being there. I say to you now, and I'm sure the others will say to you, that we need to develop a, a, a more sophisticated analysis of what is happening before our very eyes. When E. Franklin Frazier spoke about the black bourgeoisie several years ago, there was none. Materially, there was none. We could speak then of the Uncle Tom, who was part and parcel of a system of oppression. But Uncle Tom-ism was a psychocultural, it remains a psychocultural condition. It's not a set of material circumstances. Uncle Tom did not own, nor did he control, uh, the means of production. Uncle Tom was not part of the corporate ruling class of the United States of America. Today, the Colin Powells are, the Vernon Jordans are, the Ron Browns are. What I'm su suggesting to you is that there is emerging very sharp class contradictions within the African family, within the United States. And we have to rise above simply applauding whenever a black faced person is appointed to a position of government, whether it be local or national or international, and we simply say, well, wonderful, he's there, she's there, we ought to support them, regardless of whether or not they're working against our interests. They, in the, in the contemporary context, are part and parcel of the destruction of African civilization today, and we need to recognize that. That is what part of what the, our dilemma is. We also celebrating, many people are, the demise of the Soviet Union, the collapse of what used to be the evil empire, and many people are talking about how great that we're developing uh, new alliances, that need, there's emerging new third world alliances. Later on in the program, I will share some information with you, but before I introduce our first speaker, I just want to draw your attention to a document. Unfortunately, we don't have many copies. We don't have any copies. Maybe uh, we'll have someone go and make copies and make them available to you. It's a document called National Security Review Number 30, a secret study conducted by the Bush administration uh, determining how to deal with Africa in the next uh, few years. It is quite disturbing, and I won't go into any details except to say that it ought to serve as a warning for those of us who are under illusions that uh, things are changing for us. Secondly, I, I saw a very interesting article a few days ago in World Policy Journal, written by a most interesting man who seems to think that the way to solve the problems not only of the United States of America, and by extension, people like us in the process, one solution he's advancing is to have the United States of America return to the politics of the 18th century and the early 19th century by purchasing uh, parts of Africa and purchasing uh, uh, Siberia. As we've tried to point out to people on many occasions, you know, the Russia borders the United States of America. Sometimes we forget that. And when we hear discussions about North, North American free trade agreements, sometimes we forget that Russia is being dragged into this network. Well, now the talk is to purchase Siberia. And that if you were to purchase Siberia for some three or four trillion dollars, that would certainly help the uh, 
the developmental program of the so-called Democrats who now emerge in that part of the world, and that would help to sort of strengthen and broaden the base, the, the material base of the United States, and therefore strengthen it and give it the kind of global, uh, not only geographical, but economic and military power, which it doesn't now exist. There's also discussions about, about purchasing large chunks of Africa as well. So I, I mention these things to you because I think they're important for us to understand how people are looking at our continent, how people are looking at us and looking at their own problems and trying to determine how to solve their problems at our expense. And having said that, I'd like us to uh, introduce our first speaker, who, uh, Professor Edward Scobie, who has written a lot about uh, the impact of European civilization upon African people, as well as the experiences of African people in Europe itself. He's currently a professor of, uh, of history at, um, at uh, City College of New York, and uh, many of you might, might be familiar with his book, uh, Black Britannica. I would now like to introduce to you Professor Edward Scobie, incidentally someone, a foremost Pan-African scholar who will be addressing the question today. What's up, brothers and sisters? What's up? It's a very terrible thing to admit. I don't know where to begin. I have so many areas that I want to begin in. There's got to be one. But I think I'll begin from Samori's end. Brother Samori said a while ago that the United States and the other white powers that be want to buy certain areas of land on this planet. Let me remind you, my brothers and sisters, this is nothing new. Even during the time that America was a colony of Britain that has been called great for reasons that I can't find. America has been trying to buy lands on this planet. They made a great attempt to buy Cuba. They wanted to pay as much as $40 million in those far off days for Cuba. It didn't come through. They wanted to buy Haiti. They bought the Virgin Islands and they bought Puerto Rico lock, stock, and barrel. They didn't even buy the continent, our continent of Africa. They took it like a piece of what you call it, cake or whatever, and cut it in little bits in 1884 and gave each of those brigands a piece of Africa. There was German East Africa, British West Africa, French West Africa, and the devil knows what else, West Africa. They sat at the table, 16 of those Thieves, I can't find, I don't want to find any elevating word to describe monsters. So don't expect to hear them, these words from me. And they sat at the table and deliberately carved off a piece for each of the Alibaba thieves. You know the rest of the story. And when we condemn, sometimes we do. Although there a certain amount of condemnation, perhaps, is necessary 
for our people on the motherland, as of well as our people here and in the Caribbean or wherever they are, I say that the deep intrinsic or the deep significant damage came from them. We are suffering in Africa and elsewhere from the carving up of lands by people who had no use, who had no respect for what they called in those days even tribal groupings, for groupings of lands by virtue of language. Imagine two brothers in the Cameroons. One grows up speaking French and the other grows up speaking English with two different false cultural habits. No wonder it is said that we are confused. But this has been happening, the same thing happened in the Caribbean. A lot of different lingos are spoken in the Caribbean. Allegedly, they call them Spanish, they call them French, they call them Dutch or Taki Taki or Pimento, Papiamento or whatever. All these different things. You do not think so, but these have alienated us. Language is a barrier, my brothers and sisters, a barrier that was used in those colonial days to separate. They got a lot of other things that they used, class and color and complexion and whatever, to do the separating. Islands of birth, mainland, you know what I'm talking about. And it's still separating us right here in Crown Heights still. The only remedy for us is to go back to source. The source that the great Chancellor Williams was talking about. Chancellor Williams examined the African before it was contaminated. He wanted to see what the African was like before the contamination of countries that had come there and colonized. He wanted to know what we were like before the virus had been pushed into the bloodstream. That's what he wanted to know. What we really did, what did we have to say what did we offer before those others came in? That is the measure of the greatness of his book. And he makes no bones about it in saying, you know exactly what we did. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry among us, from children way up, know what Africa did before the unfortunate meeting, the unfortunate clashing with those other people, those brigands who allegedly came to colonize. But colonize is a, is a method of stealing, of burglarizing lands. You know what happened. And Chancellor Williams goes into it bit by bit by bit. And he said something that I want to bring to your notice. And my esteemed brother whom I love greatly, sitting over there, Dr. John Henry Clark, he said the same thing. And what they said, let me just tell you, just briefly what they said. What happened to Africa? What happened to Africans? And why it happened? I think we know now why it happened. All of us in here are aware of what happened and why it happened. But you know something? Present company here excluded and some company elsewhere. But we are not making any attempts to make sure it does not happen again. And it is this. Dr. Clark, 
and Dr. Chancellor Williams said, they have both stated time and time again that the African had a belief in the universality of God in all people, unfortunately in all people. And this allowed us as Africans to embrace the European as a brother and grant him access to African soil, thereby setting the, the conditions of the destruction of black civilization. It began then. We still give them the benefit of the doubt. There are some of us who call it integration. We are stuck on the word integration. And you know who's stuck on the word integration too? Curiously enough, white people. You know why? Let me tell you why. If Africans integrate with white people, they are going to integrate with empty hands, empty pockets, with nothing. They are going to integrate with them as inferiors. That is what they want. If you're on the same level with a person, you don't have to integrate with that person. They want integration. When you listen to their media, when, you, when I do happen to hear it, I'll pass on somewhere, because I don't buy their papers. I really don't buy their papers. And I look at television in between walking from the living room to the bedroom to the bathroom and back and so on. This is how I watch it, unless there's a program dealing with us, from us, not from them, from us. And you know, you'll find them saying, what are you saying then? All of them are saying, what are you saying? Do you want to go and live in a state on your own as though we cannot go and live on our, we've been living on our own all the time. All the time. But with them bending over us, breathing over us. And that is why we're in this trouble. How much more integration do we want? Do we want to be in bedrooms with them? God forbid. Integration is a word we should rub it out from an actual African dictionary completely. It has never worked and we don't want it to work. I do not want it to work and I'm sure the brothers and sisters here do not want it to work. We want to integrate with ourselves, get closer to ourselves and let no born in Jamaica, born in Georgia, born in Crown Heights, born in wherever stop us and be a barrier to us. That is what we want. We tend to think that it is only the other day that we began to learn about ourselves. That is not true. We like to say, fancy our children growing up and going to schools and being taught. What do we expect our children to be taught in those schools? Garbage. There are few of our teachers who try their best, but you know what they're doing to them. You see the latest with Dr. Jeffries, what they're trying to do to him, and they've done it to others. There is nothing at all. My sisters and brothers, let me tell you this, but I'm sure you know it. There is nothing you can say to any any, A spelled, the word is spelled A-N-Y, any white person that they're not going to say, oh yes, well, well, but, but. That but carries a multitude of other buts and things. They will never agree. Do not waste your time trying to prove anything to them. Please, don't. Deal with ourselves. Deal with ourselves. You think they go up to now, they're still saying things about Jesse Jackson, perhaps the Warren son anyway, because he may not have learned his lesson, I don't know. They'll say the same thing about Farrakhan. They'll say the same thing about Jeffries. They'll say the same thing about John, about me, about you. They ain't never going to stop. 
Brothers and sisters, I have two words to tell you about them. Drop them. <laughs> Malcolm did, but you know, you know the thing they're talking about they bring, when they talk about Malcolm, what they say? But he said that he, he spoke with, he had tea or whatever with Muslims with gray eyes, with blonde hair and so on. That's the thing they're going to pull out. That's the thing they saw in the film. With all due respects to Spike Lee and so on, I didn't see that at all. I see Malcolm as I knew him, what he was. And if there was one man who was unbending and didn't care one hoot in the white person's devil's hell was Malcolm. He didn't care what they thought, what they said. I don't care what they say about me or what they say about you. I am not going to judge you on what a white judge says about you or myself. I'm not going to judge us. I'm going to judge us by our own standards. We have standards. Use them. This is what Chancellor was trying to say, and this is what others were trying to say. And it's not new. It is not new. There is an elder whom I learned a lot from. He's more elder than I am at the moment. He's 95. Ralph Casimir. He lives in the island of Dominica. He was the secretary of the UNIA. And he was the one that brought Marcus Mosiah Garvey to Dominica and helped to change my life. I was a boy though in those days going to school and I went to hear Garvey at the Coronation Hall and my life has not been the same ever since. Ever since. And we were castigated for going to hear Garvey. The newspapers played hell. This man suffered. He was told by his boss. He was working for an attorney, a black attorney. Well, you couldn't call him black in those days. You know, um, a mulatto attorney. Cecil E. A. Rawl, a great attorney. He was a clever barrister. But he was working for him. And do you know what his boss told him? If you bring Garvey, to the country, if you attend, if you don't give up the president, president position of the Garvey movement of the UNIA in Dominica, do not come back to my office, my chambers. Ralph Kazimi said to him, Mr. Rawl, you don't have any need to tell me. I have already packed up my papers, my books. Goodbye. He never went back. He didn't starve. He didn't die because he lost a job. And to lose a job in that little island of Dominica where I happened to the ship with my parents and my grandparents and so on there. So I was born there. To lose a job there is like losing your life because jobs are few and far between, you know. They are centuries between jobs to get a job. You know what I'm talking about. In those days, still the same thing. Ain't nothing has changed. And he was the one to say, we tend to think that it's only now we know about the power of the African. Ralph Kazimi knew the power of the African in those days. He knew, Garvey knew it too. Look at a letter that he wrote. He put his, uh, some, re some selected writings together and um, he sent me some copies to, to sell out for him. But look at what he wrote. He sent a letter, a letter in the, um, to the Negro World, the Garvey paper, on May the 20th, 1922, he wrote that letter. It is as up to date and as fresh as though it was happening today. His consciousness then, in 1922, what he says, the Negro, he would, in those days they used the word, the Negro in Dominica is taught to despise Africa. He's told that, is that in that he's told that Africa is a land of jungle and forest, a land unfit for habitation, and that the native African is inhuman, savage, and, and, can, and a cannibal. Hence you will find the Negro in this part of the world 
Oh, in an alien education, an alien education despises his motherland Africa, despises his race, despises himself, and is looking upon the other fellow, the destroyer of the darker races, the liar, the negrophobe, the lord and master, to put him right. That was written in 1922. And he goes on, the truth shall make you free. And he goes on, Negroes, I appeal to you, therefore, to purify your brains. That was in the Garvey paper of May the 20th, 1922. Purify your brains. Remove the scales from your eyes. Seek the truth and be free. We are saying that today. Men who had vision, our African men were saying that in 1922. Ain't nothing new. Ain't nothing new. And he goes on here. We, what have we found out? All, something quite contrary to alien education. Africa, the land of jungle and forest, is attracting worldwide attention. The eyes of the great powers are looking towards Africa. The Englishman leaves his merry England. The Frenchman leaves his La Belle France. And even the American leaves his land of the free and home of the brave, sweet land of liberty. And they are only too glad to hasten to Africa to breathe fresh air, enjoy her riches, though jungle and forest, exploiting, stealing, and killing. Africa is no longer unfit for habitation, and the savage in human cannibal is harmless. Now study the African in human savage cannibal. In East Africa, he compels his oppressors to take to their heels. He has found out the evils of white superiority. He, the African, must make his own lord and master. He, in Morocco, he gave the Spaniards a severe beating. In Spain, if Spain is for the Spaniards, why not Morocco for the Moors? The native African is proving to the world that he is not inferior to the Caucasian. Again, if we seek the truth, we will find out that whereas the Caucasian has proceeded, has produced a Nelson, a Cromwell, a Wellington, a Napoleon, a Lincoln, a Shakespeare, a Longfellow, George Lloyd George, a Harding, a Wells, a Clamoso, the, the African has produced a Solomon, a, a Hannibal, Lucius Septimus Severus, Augustine, Louverture, Gelasius, Kojo, Duma, Pushkin, Dunbar, Garvey, you just name them. In those days, our men and women were conscious of that. So my friends, my brothers and sisters, this is nothing new. We are only continuing. We are only continuing in the things that were set for us by men like Garvey and men like Chancellor Williams and men like Dr. John Henry Clark who is still here and others. That is what we're doing. And this continuation must go on. It cannot stop. What I have to say further is no matter what you do, I said a while ago, I'll repeat it, we are going to be the same, same in the eyes of those others. I said drop them, I'll even say forget them. We have to take from them what they took from us. The Nigerian government in the days of the 70s when the oil boom was ringing and all over the world, down even in Trinidad and other places, and money was flowing like a thing they have been saying in those Creole countries like glow cocoa, money was flowing like coconut water. And you could get any amount of money when in the oil boom in those islands and those areas. The Nigerian government went to Margaret Thatcher and offered her billions of dollars to get back the Benin bronzes and the Ife sculptors from the British Museum. And I tell you, I know the British Museum went well. My beautiful sister there, Carol, will tell you, Carol Taylor, we were very close in England and we're still close now. Wonderful sister. And she will tell you, I used, that was my second home, the British Museum, in doing research and moving around. And do you know, if you take African sculpture and art and Egyptian and, 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 and Kemetic sculpture and art from the British Museum is going to be empty. Empty. I'm serious about that. 
empty, empty, and he's going to have dusty little scripts and manuscripts by Mozart and, you know, others. Little bits of papers of what Lord Allenbury did and what Nelson did and what blah, blah, blah did. And the Battle of Trafalgar and this kind of nonsense. But the uh, museum is going to be empty. The same thing can happen in those m metropolitan museums they have in New York. Thatcher said no. We colonized the country. It was ours. We controlled it. So we can't give it back. Well, this is the kind of thing we're going to face. All that they have taken from the lands, not to mention the fantastic copper and gold and silver reserves that are somewhere in Belgium and Germany and other places, we'll never get that back. All right? Let us make sure that they don't come out and they don't even take out of Africa, excreta out of Africa. Let's make, a, make sure they don't take anything out of Africa. I mean that. There is no half and half measure. You cannot be saying that you're an African and you want to get out of that terrible state that we're in, because we are in a terrible state, a state that is much worse than before, as Brother Samori was telling you. They want to go back to the old days and buy lands and pay for lands. They think money can buy everything. But I tell you this, I don't know how many of you see some of those terrible, perverted shows that they have in the mornings. Every single one of those people that run those shows, it's some kind of, it's not, they're not hung up about, white people are not hung up about sex. They're hung up about sex perversions. That's what they're hung up about. You only have to turn your television set up in the mornings and you're going to see men there with beards and with high heels and God knows what else. Women that are going with women and doing all kinds of funny, strange things that they taught our young people. They taught our young people. That's who's going to rule the world still. Well, you know what's going to happen? To those integrationists, we are going to become a race like they are, a race of perverts, if we do not do something about it and get out of it. Because they, they have nothing to offer. Even their own historians tell you, when they went to the Caribbean, when they came here, when they went to Brazil, wherever they went, the most low down, loathsome, white overseer took hold of our girls and did all kind of fantastic nasty things to them some of them not only took our girls they took our boys they were what i think they were who say they had they were two-way stretches and they took our girls and our boys and or or and with you know and that's what they taught them and today my sisters my brothers they are trying to put this blame on you and on me. We cannot allow it if we are really Africans. The people who are responsible for the mystery system, they did not think in that way. They did not. Even their education, their education, is stuck on one thing. They're worrying on how, they're not worrying about the other things in the curriculum, but one aspect of the curriculum alone that seems to be taking up the whole time of the media and all the big great brains we have here is the one that does with gays. As though education has to deal only with gays. And that's what they're about. White people can never rise above sex, my brothers and sisters. Let us put that in our minds and know that. You watch those simpering people on the, you know, and they look like the devil too. Malcolm was right. Malcolm was right. And I say this, I say this thing forcefully and I mean it. Because, you know, if this kind of thing is not stopped, 
Let us forget about teaching, trying to teach our children, change curriculums and all of that, you know. We have to do it. We have to start the ball a rolling. And one point I want to make, we should not follow in their steps. We have a habit, like they have, of talking about or giving plaudits to our men and women who do things among us. You don't have to be an intellectual. Sometimes intellectuals, you, they can't be trusted. There are exceptions, admittedly. But I'm saying, all of us, we wait until they die to say nice things in churches about them. Why can't we show them while they're alive that we love them and the work that they're doing? That is a Western European habit we have that we must break. I'm not saying that you don't. What is the point of having a great big monument at the corner of a street or the inside of a park to one of our great men? You know what's going to happen? Pigeons are going to drop their business on his head and he's going to stay there. And perhaps people might write graffiti on it. Who knows? I'm not saying that you shouldn't have these things. But at the same time, while our people are alive, let us cherish them. You cannot get a Charles Williams again. You can get somebody else who perhaps would be even doing more than he did. But let us, while he was alive, we allow our men and our women to vegetate and stay like cobwebs in homes for the aged and we leave them there waiting to die. It is not right, my sisters and brothers. While they are with us, they need to be shown at least some kind of humanity. We talk about this great humanity that we have. Where is it? It did not extend itself to Chancellor Williams. It did not extend itself, or it has not extended itself, to John Jackson. I was fortunate enough, and I say fortunate, fortunate, 19 or 17 or 19 years ago, I was in an office, sharing an office with Bill Mackey and John Jackson and Dr. Clark was teaching in the evening. He was, apart from his full-time job at Hunter College, he was teaching classes at City College and at nights when these men met, I would only sit down and listen. And I learned more from them in there. These men were just talking, and I had the benefit. All the books I got from John Jackson, he gave them to me and autographed them for me. And I prized them. I wouldn't lend them to myself, even <laughs> those books. And so I'm saying, these are jewels that we should cherish. I still use a syllabus. If Dr. Clark is not there, tell, don't let him know that I said that. But it is his syllabus. I've never seen a syllabus like that in my life. Not only I use it, Jeff uses it. James uses it. It's a powerful syllabus that he had done years and years ago. A masterful piece that should be an, a, an example for all people teaching in Africana Studies Department, and all people who want to teach their children. It's a powerful piece of work. It's a book on its own. It, can, it is a book on its own. And I have a copy that he'd given me that I still, I don't lend it to, again, myself, you know. I cherish it. But I'm saying to you, it is now that we want. He's not the only one. Chancellor Williams is not the only one. We had other men who were very vibrant in the fight because it is a struggle. When you are born, 
If you are born black, you are born to struggle. I don't care whether you are bourgeois or doujois or no joie or whatever joie, but you are born. Don't let those bourgeois people sing because they're in as much salt as you and I are in. But at least we don't walk on our knees, we walk strong on our feet. They've been walking on their knees all their life. I don't doubt if they would be able to walk on their feet now. I doubt it. And some of the best minds, I have heard some of the best minds root like dogs for scraps of favor. I have. They're still doing it. Some of the men are unsung, unheard of. In a, at a time when that's the thing I was afraid of. I just said at a time, and I was showed time. <laughs> so, Maury, okay. And there was a time in the struggle in the 20s and the 30s. There were lots of people involved in it, lots of men whose names you don't hear. Men who were, they call them street corner orators, who were in the streets of Harlem and the streets all over saying the same thing that we are sitting here and what we are saying now. They were on the streets saying that. People like Hubert Harrison, they called him the Black Socrates, a brilliant man. Dr. Clark knew him well. He had other men, Claude McKay. Claude McKay, although he came from Jamaica, but how much African he was. He could write one of the most powerful poems, If We Must Die. The fact that he came from Jamaica didn't mean a thing. That was an African talking, if we must die, if all Africans must die. That's what he was talking about. They had other people, Richard Moore, who had the, who had the bookstore in Harlem, the Frederick Douglass bookstore. They had others too, men who had come from all over the Caribbean and from everywhere. People like um, Richard Moore, Cyril Briggs, Wilfred Domingo, Dr. Clark knew them well. They were there struggling, street corners, doing what we are doing today. And the struggle must continue, and it must go on as it's going on. There is no hope if we don't continue it. And on that note, I'd like to tell you that Chancellor Williams made one statement, and that statement applies as well as he do. In his book, before you even read the book, he said something that should force you to read. There are those who have studied the book, like my good brother Leo sitting there, who had it in classes, you know, study, study groups, and who know a lot about the book. But Chancellor said something in the book, I always like to remind people of it. It's, a, it's something he used here at the beginning of the book, if I can find it. And I'll, I'll depart after I have found it. And he says, oh boy, it's not there. And he's something about to do with history. Oh yes, he, he starts part one. He starts his book like that. What became of the black people of Suma? The traveler asked the old man. For ancient records show that the people of Suma were black. What happened to them? Ah, the old man sighed. They lost their history, so they died. Brothers and sisters, don't let our history die. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want to thank Brother Scobie and uh, remind you that we will be having a discussion, an intense one, we hope, following the presentations. I just want to say a couple of things because I feel I have a, a, a responsibility to do so. That um, while I would never attempt to take credit away from Europeans for what they have done, I think uh, we should be careful and we have to be careful sometimes in the manner in which we pose or juxtapose the evils of Europeans against those of Africans. I remember John Henry Clark once said something which when he, the first few lines of this axiom 
or the first few words of the axiom uh, begun to offend some people, myself included. But as he developed the, the, the thought, I realized where he was going, and I agreed with him 100%. He said that African people, that we are perfect, we are perfect people. We are perfect. And I had a little problem with that, except he went on to explain. He said, like, we are perfect like any other people, in that we have inherent in us both positive and negative contradictions. We have to have that dialectic in order to make us what we are, otherwise we are something else, we won't be human. We have our brigands, and we have our kings, and uh, we have our altruists, and we have our traitors, and so on and so forth. Conversely, so do other people. And I think that while it is true that we should never uh, shy away from, as I said, give people full credit for the crimes which they have perpetrated against us, we need to not, in, in, for a moment, attempt to obfuscate what others within our own families uh, have done. I, for one, am beyond the point at which I would want to devote a lot of time to us talking about what white people have done. I think we need to continue to do that. I think as we approach the 21st century, we need to focus on the internal contradictions within the African continent, within the African family, and look, take a hard look at what is wrong and why we aren't going where we're supposed to go. I think when we look, when we look, well, some, I, sometimes when we talk about what happened to Africa, what happened to the destruction of African, the African continent? If you're saying to me that the European is not a Superman, if you say that he's not a Superman, he's a regular person like everybody else, and you're saying to me that in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, centuries, he came to Africa. Mind you, we didn't have the Concord in those days. There was no QE2. There weren't any B-52s and B-2 bombers. So a handful of people came in some sailing ships to the African continent. And after they left, the entire continent collapsed. A whole people, a whole continent was enslaved. So either we are saying on the one hand that the, these handful of people who came were supermen, or we are saying dialectically that he had some help. He had some help. So I think we have to take a hard look at this. Who killed Malcolm X? We understand that there are forces behind, but we're not going to make any progress until and unless we recognize the enemy within. I am saying to you that, I, that we must come to grips with that. Let's not play any games with ourselves anymore. We are on the threshold of the 21st century. Who killed Patrice Lumumba? Who killed Amilcar Cabral? Who killed uh, 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 Walter Rodney? Who killed Marilyn Mbwabi? Let's be clear about this. So what I'm saying, let's be clear about what the others have done, but let's be clear about what we are doing to ourselves. You don't, lock, you don't have those locks on your doors because Harry Bernstein or Louis Shapiro is about to take your mother off as she's coming from a nursing job at night. Let's look at what is wrong. Let's look at the root of what is wrong. Let's not take credit away from anybody else, but let's look at ourselves. I just want to reinforce that. I'm not saying to suggest or negate anything that was said before. Now, having said that, I'd like to point out that we are going to be moving into an area looking at the phenomenon of culture, psychocultural manipulation, the use, the control of our minds, of information. I don't believe that anybody in this room or anybody who who, who uh, knows how to read, who has read a book, who has written a, a page of paper, can argue that over the years, over the centuries, that information has not been the major weapon against the, the emancipation of African people. As, a, as an, a major weapon in the arsenal used by our enemies against our emancipation. And the sister who is, will be speaking with us now, Sister Rashida Ishmael Abu Bakar, is a psychologist, she's a poet, and a number of other things, political analyst, originally born in the continent of Africa. She teaches at uh, Rutgers University, 
and elsewhere at Pratt University, also here in New York City, Mr. Rashida Ishmael Abubakar. I'd like to invite her to the podium now. I'm really um, sorry. Thank you. Um, I want to say um, how um, intimidating, to some extent, it is to be here this afternoon. Um, when I first came here to study, um, it was my intent, along with a few of of us. Um, that we were going to be this uh, new group, um, this new cultural group in Africa, in particular in West Africa, who was going to bring about a whole new cultural movement and a theater. And um, I was going to be Africa's first opera singer. My husband at that time was going to be um, the first, um, the first uh, musician who would connect um, the musics that African people had created in the West um, with the music that was still being done in Africa. And we came here and went to our universities and found ourselves looking for the American Negro and not being able to find them because in so many ways, physically, they looked like us, so we couldn't use the physical criteria. And then we tried to find another way that would tell us where, where these American Negroes were. It, it started to, to, to boil down to what we could perceive would be a kind of behavior that was culturally based. Finally, we found that there was such a minuscule difference that we couldn't use the term anymore. So we just started to see them as another part of the family. But there were cultural and I would say political forces that were working from the very onset against it. At the beginning it was extremely subtle. So one didn't always understand what was happening, what was actually happening to one and also what one was seeing but not seeing. It was perhaps in 61 when I was about ready to graduate with my bachelor's that everything kind of came to a head. Patrice Lumumba, um, Patrice Lumumba was assassinated and there was a call from a, a group of students born on the continent the All African Students Union um, nationwide to make a very strong protest. And it was in this process that I really began to evaluate what my contribution would, 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 would mean um, to Africa and to African people. Um, after graduation, I went home and worked for about a year. I came back on a, a government uh, fellowship. A part of it, at least 45 to perhaps even as much as 60% of it, was supported by the United States government. When we got here, we were given about a two-page list of places and people who were deemed um, I'm trying to put it delicately. Um, kind of controversial, shall we say, and could possibly um, uh, take our minds away from, from our task, which was to gain these graduate degrees and become a part of the um, intellectual elite that uh, Dr. Scobie just talked about. Um, lo and behold, at least 20 of these people on the very first page, or groups, were all people and groups that I had known. 
and I n not felt that they had sort of led me astray. But I must say that one of the places I'd always wanted to go and did come immediately was to Harlem. So I thought, well, I'd better get some information about these groups. So I got on the subway and I went to the Schomburg and that was probably the worst thing I could have ever done because I couldn't take myself away from that place. It was in the old building, the one next door to the new one. And Dr. Hudson was the, was the curator. And there was this person sitting in the back. So I just thought, ah, this is the local eccentric. You know, every community has one. This person, you could only see the top of his head buried beneath piles and piles of books on one side and magazines and newspapers on the other side. And one day, I was looking for a book, and nobody seemed to have heard of this book. And I thought, ah, this is really weird. I can't believe that I could come to the Schomburg and I can't find this book. And I think I was sort of fussing to myself. And out from this pile of books came this voice. You Africans are always causing trouble in the wrong place, so I'm ready to see who is this uh, person in the pile saying such a horrific thing. And it was Dr. Clark, buried underneath all these books. And he said, just go to shelf, da 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 da, and go to the row, la 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 la, and there you will find volume one and volume two. And I said, oh my God. And I went, and it was there. And I, and I said to somebody, you know, this is very strange, this little weird man sitting back there told me da 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 and it was true. He said, oh, you don't know who is that? That's, that's, that's Dr. John Henry Clark. Ah, oh, so yes. Okay, so it's Dr. John Henry Clark. No, 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 no. And this and this and this. And it was at that time that the book uh, he had edited um, on the history of, of, of Harlem was quite uh, in, 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 in vogue, at, I say in vogue at that time. And so I read this book to get a sense of him. And he'd also um, edited a collection of short stories uh, by black writers. And I, and I, and I got a sense of, of him. And after that, I would try to arrange that I could come to the Schomburg at least once a week. And Dr. Clark was always there. And I say that in in most humble way that that the friendship or the familyhood. I always think of him as, as, my, as, my, as my intellectual father or one of my intellectual fathers because he was always, always, as much as he knew, he was always trying to find out more. And the purpose of that information was to give and to share. And, and I just want to take that moment, tell that story, to pay tribute to him as we also mentioned um, um, Chancellor Williams, whom I didn't have the good fortune to know like that. I'd met him, but I didn't have the good fortune to know him as I knew and as I had had to know um, Dr. Clark, um, having gone to his house many times and having been in his presence. Uh, I can assure you it's a learning experience unto itself. And it was out of that that I began to find, I guess you could say, find my way from one discipline perhaps to another, which sort of led me into a strange field called black psychology. And I say strange because at Rutgers, where I have been for 16 years, um, I have just, um, at least I have tendered my resignation. Um, they have decided to give me a year to make a final decision, but I think that I will not go back next year. That is not to say that I don't, I don't object to having worked with very fine scholars, but I think that after 16 years, it creates a space for someone else to come along, and they must make their mistakes and find their paths just as I did. And I think that, um, that that's, I feel comfortable with this decision. But the reason that I, I found myself going into a more and more into black psychology was because I was very dissatisfied with the psychology as a discipline, the way I was being taught. As a result of that, I, and my political awareness, I lost my scholarship um, and had to, to work. 
uh, all through graduate school. Those of you who have done it, you, you know how difficult it is. Um, but, you know, one, one does what one has to do at the time you have to do it, in the way that you have to do it. And you hope you have the strength to do it. And you find the strength. I mean, nobody is as weak as, as people would, would have would have us all believe. We are really very strong. Um, whoever put this protoplasm together is, is truly a supreme being because um, it operates sometimes whether we like it or not, or even, even in, in opposition to, to, to our, our, our will to, to, to survive. Um, so it was out of all of this that I found myself finding, finding, my, finding my path. But I had very few mentors. One of the good fortunes that I had was when I was doing my master's, I had the good fortune to be placed in Harlem at a daycare center that had a traditional African board. And that was Hope Daycare Center. And they had an all African board that had started on its own. At that time, the division of um, uh, child, um, um, early childhood was under the division of, of the welfare department, and one could bring their children there for other reasons. I'm telling you all this for a reason. I hope I'm not boring you. At any rate, it was there that I met, and through the board, that I met Dr. Margaret Lawrence, whose daughter has immortalized her in Baum and Gilead. Um, that was Dr. Margaret Lawrence and Dr. June Christmas, who became the first black commissioner for health. Those two women, along with Lillian Vaughn, who was my site supervisor, those three women, but the latter two in particular, really helped me shape and um, focus how I could remain in a discipline like psychology and, 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 and told me literally to use those things that I knew and to, 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 find, to find a way to merge them. And they didn't think me crazy. They didn't think me silly. They didn't think that I was trying to do um, a black-white behavior. I wasn't trying to create an alternative of white psychology as a discipline and color it black. I was really saying very much what, what, what Chancellor Williams says, that the concept that, 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 that African people and that Africa is an empty vessel that can only be fulfilled from without. He says that that is when the destruction of black civilization began, when this vessel began to be filled from without, that it was a negative encounter and that it increased in its negativity and thus it thwarted the possibilities for the constant rise, the, 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 the rise of, of, of rightness was constantly under attack by the negative onslaught. And, and so all of these things um, and all of the people that I was meeting and, and, and all of the excitement of the 60s and the 70s really propelled me to, 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 to study more and to listen more and to try to find some way that I could stay in behavioral sciences but find a way that I could focus and know when a particular modality would be more effective for African people because I had made a choice that those were the people that I preferred to be with and to use my, my capacities um, for. And it was along this whole process that I, that I uh, came to where, I guess, I, 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 I found myself struggling 16 years ago. Um, very basically, black psychology, as, as I have been teaching, um, comes out of a, a, look, a, 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 a theory, not necessarily a theory in the sense of a hypothesis, but, uh, but it, it proposes that African people are a non-dichotomous people and that, and that their existence is the manifestation of, is the positive manifestation of the existence of God. Now, that could be termed as a materialistic God, 
which a lot of people who have read Marx would understand. But what it means is that religion or a sense of ethics is the essence of African development of the, of the psyche. So that there is no original sin. Therefore, the color that people are is neither a blessing nor a curse, but it is rather a reflection of climate and all of those things that identify a person or a people with, with land, with flora and fauna, and with whatever god or gods they believe operate in that territory. So you take away the notion of original sin. You place the human being in the center of his or her own life. Therefore, the drama, the enactment of their behavior, the, the enactment of their activity becomes ethical. And it is ethical because they are the, they are the positive manifestation of God, not the negative manifestation of God. Therefore, to be black is not the manifestation of the sin or the curse of, of, of God as the inherent evil of, 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 of African people. This, 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 this life then is ordered around three basic principles. One is the moral order, the other is the natural order, and the other is the one which encompasses um, 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 the Godhead. First, it places the human being in relation to all other things. It says that the human being has a responsibility for being at the top of the animal pyramid, and therefore it has a responsibility for itself and for all other species of life. The primary uh, responsibility is to respect and to take care of, one, the human species and all other animal forms, flora and fauna, which you could say today is basic ecology. But our parents were talking about that at the very beginning of time. There is also the relationship between the human species one to the other, that is the relationship of people within a family. It is the responsibility of the, of the parents to be the custodians of the life. They are only the custodians, and the primary purpose of parents is to take care of the generation to whom they are the custodians, so that that generation will, one, be the continuum, and two, the, the affirmation that, that, that a supreme being or God does exist, because it is that group which will be the potential for the parents of the future. At the same time, they are assuring themselves of ancestral or antiquity, because they will become the grandparents of the children to whom they are caring for at that time. So the, so that the things work in a kind of a triad, um, but, but the triad is overlaid from the, from, go, from the center going backward rather than starting in the middle and going forward. The future is only assured because the present exists. The present exists because the past exists. Hmm? Then you have the relationship of, and the acknowledgement of what, of what the environment does. Everybody, most, most African religions say that they know who their gods are by the particular gifts that they give. In my area, we say that the bananas um, are gods, are, and, and, and fruits and vegetables that grow wild that do not require human hand. Those are God's promises, or I'm using God as a generic term. Those are God's assurances that, that this, that this, that this that this being will never forsake because it will provide the sustenance of the creatures that they that that that, that are created. So that there is there is this inherent then activity, which that is what I call behavior. It is the activity that we engage in. And so therefore the behavior is supposed to be good. And therefore when you do your duty, it is a form of worship. So that there is no separation between when you worship, how you worship, if you worship, and if you live. To live is to be in a state of goodness. And that is the balance that we struggle for. 
So that when we talk about what um, Samori is saying about recognizing those, that part of us that doesn't do what it should do, when we violate the order, when we do not, as my grandmother used to say, if you give your brother bread for stone, he will give you back broken teeth. That is what we have right now in Africa and in the African world. And it's this part that I'd like to focus on now and sort of bring it to a close. What we, are, what we have done is we have seen ourselves surrounded by a superhuman strength that is called white people. And we have seen ourselves within the interior of that as a weakened, victimized people. Psychologically, it then means that we have been rendered destroyed. It is only in the reclamation, the restoration of the black psyche that we then take ourselves out of this, 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 this malaise and put ourselves on the, the stage of humankind. We cannot even imagine that we have the possibility to change some of the most basic things in our lives, lest someone else comes in. One identifies it for us. And then, in that definition, therefore, prescribes the treatment. Hmm? So, so, so that what we, are, what we say when we go these development schemes in Africa, we say we have to go there and teach these women how to be mothers. But there have been mothers all this time, and when they come, they find people. How, the illnesses that they find, who is responsible? Everybody wants to say who is responsible. People, when people, when people are left alone, they create and develop within the context of their land, of their geographic, and of their cultural space. You can bring certainly certain kinds of advancements, and I use that in quotes, but the basic structure has to, has to fit, has to, be, has, to be, has to be customized, shall we say, to, to, to the cultural dictates of where people are. That is, the Jews should not think that just because you cannot introduce tropical fruits in Sweden, that the Swedes are backward, cannot grow, cannot, cannot grow, and that there's something innately inferior to the soil of Sweden, it, 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 it comes out of a climatic difference. Nor should we assume that because we don't have snow in, 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 in northern Ghana, that there's something wrong, and therefore we must import some um, chemical uh, uh, means of manufacturing snow as we do in Vermont. The two things, do, the two things are not, necess are not com compar comparable and they can both exist in their own geographic locations without a need to compare one better or one worse than the other. And so often we get caught up in that. And, 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 and that is because we haven't the ability to perceive ourselves in the center of the drama of our own lives. And that is what we have to struggle for, to struggle for the currency of ourselves in our lives, to take control of ourselves, if you show me a child who is misbehaving in any classroom from K to 12, I will show you a child who comes from a household where diet is probably a main, major problem, where there is an excessive amount of fats, where there's an excessive amount of sugar, where there's an excessive amount of salt, and where there is little social intercourse, that is, modulated, loving, careful undertones to the information that is passed between the custodians, whoever they are, whether they are the biological parents or not, the custodians in that child's life, and the expectations that are already um, shared with that child. We are social animals, and we cannot survive without another human species. Therefore, all that we learn, we learn from each other, even when we learn something negative. You cannot have a language around a child that is very inhumane 
very ungracious and expect that child to go to school and act like a good little girl and listen. Where does the child take the rage? What does the child do about how horrible they feel? How can you say, I know you can do better when there's nothing in that child's life, no one, no human being has said to that child, I care enough for you that I will not let you be hungry, I will give you a balanced diet, I will give you sufficient clothing, I will teach you basic social skills so that you will be able to present yourself in the best light possible, which will bring honor to you and therefore perhaps to me, instead of putting it the other way around. We have to redefine our goals, our values, what is it that we see in that child? The child is not an extension of ourselves. We are the custodians of our children. That means we are the primary caretakers. That is our responsibility by even having life ourselves. And it is only that way that we can continue, that we can continue. And that goes for all the other things that we do. We cannot say that I'm selling this particular thing because if I don't sell it, somebody else will. You've already compromised, which means at that point that you know you're doing something that is wrong. How you make it end does not take away nor begin to restore your own psyche because you are participating in a, in a, in a, in a, in a negative um, act activity. You, we, have to, we have to be able to say that it's all right if we don't get 95s or our children don't get 95s on, a, on an exam. We have to be able to say, I will love you if you get a 70. I would like it if you got a 90, but I would love, I will still love you if you get a 70. We have to be able to love ourselves even when we're not as good as we would like to be. And there you can borrow a European psychologist, Maslow, has this thing called self-actualization. And the last part of this test has to do with bringing all the elements of a human being together. And out of that, that bringing one's self into being. And he says that a, an actualized, a self-actualized person is one who has the capacity to love themselves along with the good, and I'm using absolute terms, the good and the bad, the positive and the negative. Too often in our quest to reconstruct the African glory, we cite only the glory, we do not cite the negative. It is only in knowing what is wrong so that we could know what not to do. Otherwise, we may find ourselves repeating too many things that would best be left in antiquity. One of those things, and I'm, I'm winding down, one of those things um, we're going to talk about tomorrow, tomorrow night on WBAI is this new business about whether or not clitoridectomy is something that we need to consider as something to be occurring in the 20th century. I would, just because it, it occurred in the past and therefore there was a reason for it, so consequently it should be kept alive because there is a reason for it. Well, at one time we did a lot of things and we have stopped doing those things because we have found that they had deleterious um, consequences psychologically and physiologically. There is no reason to continue doing something wrong. And that is, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that is the end of it. What I would like to see us do would be to, to, to really be able, slowly develop this muscle, this psychological apparatus, consider it a muscle. I would like to see us exercise this muscle daily to find one thing that we really see as our strength and then find one thing 
that we see as our weakness and try to develop the stronger thing so, so securely that we will begin by, by process of elimination to decrease the weakness. Someone who suddenly has had a life that was organized around drinking, around alcohol, and, I, and, and I'm talking about when it is out of control. Mm -hmm. there, there are certain social things and physiological things that you have done to yourself and your environment in that process of drinking. Yes, you have gone to work, but you've organized other aspects of your time and demands of your body where that alcohol has been there. You cannot suddenly cut it out because one, the body has already developed a dependency on it. So it will create a response in you, not just the urge to drink, but also the inability to function without it because you have made your body function with it. So you have to know what you need to put in your body that would compensate and at the same time build the body now that you are no longer doing the drinking excessively. And at the same time, because you have dislodged this, 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 you have to now also create other social, social activities that you can do that will also be as rewarding and at the same time will be positive for you. That is how you have to think of yourself because you live in an environment of international oppression, whether it is racism, whether it is sexism, whether it is class or cultural differences, because you live in an environment where that has permeated our lives to such minutia that you have within one family people arguing over whether or not they should be traditional Yoruba in 1992, having not been on the continent for three, five hundred years, right? Christians and, and Islam, or even Judeo, uh, Ju Judaism, or even, or even atheism. All of that exists sometimes in the context of one family. But what was the social fabric of that family unit constructed around, and how, how what was the goodness of it? So you look at the philosophical imperatives of that family and say the strength of this family has been organized around whatever. And, it, and if I go away from that, I have to be able to, to identify and take the strength of that family, of that family unit, into wherever I go. And if that new place that I'm going does not accommodate in a glorious way, what I have brought with me, it may not be the structure I need to go. It does not mean that you cannot appreciate Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Yoruba, Buddhism, or whatever. It just means that there's been a cultural uh, and, and, a, and a psychic history that, that you may not be ready for that at that time. So I would like to just um, close with, because um, um, Samori said that there would be time for questions and answers. I would just like us to, to, to try to get ourselves in, um, a psycho, in a psychological state where we would not have to compare the strengths of ourselves with past glories in a very general way of Africa. That is not to say that we do not use that as inspiration for where we should be and where we need to go beyond. Huh? And nor at the same time do we need to demonize any other group, any other group for their extreme um, lack of humanity in their dealings with us. They are just as psychologically um, destroyed in for doing what they're doing. As, as we may be for having been the recipients. But I assure you, racism is a social disease. It is sexually transmitted, just like syphilis. It is contagious, and it is deadly, and it destroys the host, 
and the recipient. It is when you destroy the germ that both the host and the recipient have the possibilities of physical and psychological health. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Rashida. Uh, in a minute, we're going to be introducing uh, Professor John Henry Clark, and we expect uh, Brother James Smalls joining us as well. <clears throat> Following which, we will have uh, enter into a discussion period. I just want to reinforce a couple of things that um, the speakers have said thus far. Uh, Brother. Brother Scobie mentioned earlier, was discussing the question of um, our lack of control, address the issue of, of power and the lack of power which our people, um, which, which are reflected in our, in, our, in our existence today. And Rashida, in discussing the manner in which the society and, and values which are imposed upon our young people, and uh, family entities and all, all other social uh, structures within which we exist determine and determine our lives also help to shape our relationship to this question of power. Many of us, in fact all of us, quoted and referred to stories, little uh, experiences, little bits and pieces we picked up from Professor John Henry Clark. I talked earlier about his uh, statement about the completeness of the African family, having within it both positives and negatives. And I wouldn't wish to extend that to anybody else since we're really just uh, addressing the question of the African family. I also want to reinforce the point that I don't want to take credit away from anyone for having put us in the position or worked very hard and continue to work very hard to put us in the position where we are in now, which is what Brother Scobie was talking about. Our theme is the question of the destruction of black civilization. And I'm sure that Professor Clark in this, addressing this will also talk about the reconstruction of black civilization as well. May I now please present Dr. John Henry Clark. Mm -hmm. I'm very pleased to be here and be a part of this conflict. I was born in conflict and I expect to die in that. My colleagues are kinder to our enemies than I hope to be and kinder than I'm willing to be. I do not in any way intend to let any black off the hook or shy away from identifying the responsibility we have for our predicament. Nor do I intend to rationalize anything European because no freedom loving people ever came out of Europe no humanity ever came out of Europe. And that every invader that ever hit the shore of every country in the world did more harm than good. We are hung up with a lie that we're going to have to get rid of. The lie about the invader and the conqueror as the spreader of civilization. No one ever spread any civilization anywhere, anytime, any place. This is just as true when blacks are invading blacks. It's true across the board. People do not 
invade other people's country to spread civilization. They take over their way of life, laugh at their gods to benefit themselves. Now the subject is the destruction of African civilization. My approach is that you can destroy something by neglecting it. I am always in the process of finishing a book. I write as well as I breathe because it is a way of life. I'm finishing a book of my speeches for Kent State called Who Destroyed, Who Betrayed the African World Revolution and five other speeches. I've just finished editing Who Betrayed the African World Revolution. I am strong at assessing responsibility to Africans for what they did and what they failed to do in bringing off their revolution and betraying their revolution and destroying their own potential. I am also strong in assessing guilt to our enemies. I will not argue whether the Jews killed Christ. One Roman soldier standing by was so powerful, all he had to say is that, leave that man alone, that'd been the end of it. Rome was in charge of that part of the world at the time. So the responsibility for life, for Christ's death, rests with the Romans. I will not argue about who was responsible for the life of Malcolm X. Because the way he was killed was not a black killing style. The esprit de corps, the style, the method was not, was not black. I will acknowledge that black hands could have pulled the trigger. But if he examined the body, the way the bullets hit the body, all those bullets didn't come from straight from that audience. Some of those bullets was coming from another direction. So those who wanted him killed wanted to be absolutely sure if the black assassins didn't get him, There'll be other bullets coming from another direction. We are passion killers. If you steal a black man's country, you might get away with it. Steal a black man's woman, he'll kill you. <laughs> black man say, I'm going to kill you. Bought him 24 hours. Maybe his passion will cool down and he'll forget about it. Everything has its style. I want to talk briefly on how you destroy things by neglecting them. You can destroy a flower by not giving it water. You can destroy a marriage without giving it love. You can destroy the disposition of a child without giving it a hug. We destroy the great potential of the reclaiming of African civilization by not staking our claim at the right time. At the time after the Supreme Court decision, 
the freedom rides, the rise of the civil rights movement, the rise of the concept of a Caribbean Federation, the stirring of the African independence movement, principally after the independence of Ghana in 1957, there was a merger, or could have been a merger, of the Caribbean effort, the African-American effort, and the African effort. We didn't bring it together, we blew it. Everybody doing his private thing and not coming together. Now, if the black American had been understood because he is, for better or worse, the best technically trained African on the face of the earth, although he is undertrained, being undertrained, he is still the best technically trained African on the face of the earth. He's the one African trained in combined military operation, land, air, and sea. He's the best trained in research. He don't know what the hell to do with it. And he'll research for, for white folks more than he research for black people. He won't even look up his auntie, his grandma. Now in the West Indies, they know more about black, white kings than they know about Taki and Mansung and all the traditional Caribbean leaders of slave revolts. In Brazil, they know more about Brazilian or Portuguese reprobates than they know about Zumbe and the great African rebels. So I'm saying that we have not used our best equipment to reclaim a special kind of civilization that we produce, and that is a civilization and a heritage of resistance. Now, in the United States, because of the institutions that we had to build, each African people function under the a circumstances dictated by his oppressor or his colonial master. We don't talk about superiority or inferiority, better or worse, because that's stupid. We're talking about each one trapped by a circumstance of history over which neither one had any control. And each one is behaving under this circumstance as best he could. And each one must be understood in the light of this circumstance. Why then did the black American produce more entrepreneurship prior to a bag of worms called into integration than any other African? Why then come that bag of worms, he threw it away so happy to become a part of someone else's thing, eat someone else's food that wasn't even, didn't taste good in the first place, but at least he was with them. He had not established a firm belief in something the circumstances of history forced him to create, and that is an independent institution. People rise and fall within the context of institutions in no other way. Institutions are the frameworks that people create. Oh, a civilization, a culture container, 
when you take them out of the original culture container of their creation. Now, it is here in the United States for black Americans and exiled Caribbean scholars who couldn't get to first base in the Caribbean because the Caribbeans always exiled their scholars because you couldn't last a day at home unless you get killed. So they get, send their scholars over here and we become the beneficiaries of Caribbean scholarship. This is what makes black American intellectualism so unique. They not only become the beneficiary of Caribbean scholarship, they become the beneficiary of some African scholarship that can't be understood in Africa. So having this, this beautiful deuce mixture of scholars, a unique intellectual being that could be called a special kind of civilization was created. This did not prove anybody was better than anybody. It proved that somebody was different, and difference is never better or worse. Difference is difference, and that's what you have to deal with. And everybody have to take that damn nose out of the damn air and understand that. We keep parading before each other based on who our master. What we're doing, we, we make comparative studies of slave masters. My slave master better than your slave master. Well, hell, if you get slave master, none of them were good. Now, what I'm trying to say I'm trying to prove how all three of us failed to make claims that we could have made which would have put us in a position not only to make the proper claim for our civilization, but to make a claim on the world over and above the claims that we have made. We got hung up with foreigners' religion. We got hung up with concepts that we didn't create. We will not acknowledge the fact that prior to the coming of foreigners, fakers and fools, to Africa, there was no word in any African language that meant G-O-D. All of these are foreign imports, and yet we had the greatest spirituality we ever had before we heard the name Christ, which is a, a, a foreign creation. We had Christianity, we had democracy, we had humanity, we had built civilizations and structures of life that lasted thousands of years without the word jail because no one had ever gone to one. We didn't have the word divorce because no one ever had one. Now you tell me this is an uncivilized people? Never heard of an orphanage because no one ever thrown away any children? Never heard of what old people's home because no one ever threw away grandma? That's a civilization. That's humanity. In my own travels in Africa, and I traveled extensively in Africa. I read every book on Africa I could get. Then I took a little money I made hustling at NBC at night, semi-executive job, house manager. I was a chief porter. <laughs> <laughs> Head of the cleanup crew. <laughs> then I graduated to kind of a clerical job. But the most important thing, I saved enough money to go to Africa and stay a year. That's my main point. <laughs> go and get my, pe get my, my people to get lost. So I'm traveling. I always travel third class in Africa, cheap as I can be, you know. <laughs> so I'm on a border between Ghana, between Ghana and um, Togo, right at a city called Afleo. 
traveling with an airway who's got a family there. He, so he put, they put us up for the night. They don't know me. He hadn't seen them in three years. They don't know he's coming. And they put us up and greet us nicely. Prepare us dinner for us. The wife is kidding the husband. And she's speaking perfect English. And he's a little clerk in Barclays Bank. And she said that they've got three children. She's not going to rob. Have any more babies tell you promise to teach? When you married me, you promise to teach me to read. No more babies tell you teach me to read. They're laughing about it, Jocelyn. Beautiful human relationship. Came in the morning, everybody's lined up waiting. I said, what are everybody waiting for? Waiting for you to take your shower. I said, what are everybody waiting for me to take the shower? You're the guest. They didn't owe me nothing. I never did anything for them. Never seen them in my life. Ah, oh, you see, this is Africa's beautiful kindness. Her brotherhood. This is how white people got in. White people accepted kindness as capitulation. That barbarian from that icebox in Europe don't know how to accept kindness. And he took advantage of it. Well, anyway, I took a shower. And she served me breakfast. And the one thing, I grew up in an exceptionally poor family, sharecroppers from Alabama. I was so poor I couldn't refuse anything. <laughs> but the one thing I would refuse is oatmeal. <laughs> And that's what she served me for breakfast. <laughs> I ate every mouthful. <laughs> now, my main point is that the way these Africans treated me, the kindness, the acceptance of my humanity, a stranger who they owed nothing, was a civilization. <laughs> and when I departed. She was still kidding her husband by teaching her to read. I said, if there's anything I can do for you, and she said she, she's having a hard time getting needles. He said he's having a hard time getting a special kind of a pipe. So I sent that to them and oh, by the end of the year I was just halfway joking when I wrote them and they answered, she answered, she answered. And she made a point to let me say, I wrote this letter. My husband finally told me to read, and I'm pregnant again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a beautiful humanity in Africa's ways of life. When we don't have to bother or be concerned with other people, we are a beautiful people, one to the other. And the ugliest thing we do to each other sometimes involves catering to other people yeah. or trying to impress other people by letting their presence interfere with our relationship one to the other. What I'm saying is that 1957 to 1960 and 61, right straight on to the march on Washington, the African world had the attention of the world in such a manner our former enemies thought we had power or potential power, and they were ready to make concessions to us. We blew it with the civil rights movement because it became a consumer rights movement. We were so anxious to get close to them, we didn't get close enough to ourselves. 
We didn't strengthen our institutions in this country. They blew it in the Caribbean Federation because they couldn't bring those islands together into a solid nation state, connected nation state. They had bought all of the color gradations that they still are hung up with. Jamaica could have become one of the great island nations of the world and could have become one of the great island civilizations of the world because it had forgotten, as most Caribbean nations had forgotten, their great revolutionary heritage. No one got across to Caribbean people in general, and Jamaicans in particular, that they had had in more than 200 years of struggle. And of all the Africans away from home, they had the most consistent revolutionary heritage. Now there were 250 slave revolts in the United States, mostly failures. Failures because in the United States we were blocked in from all sides. We couldn't win. Even if we win, we would have eventually lost. Because we did not control the exit or the entry to the revolutionary area. In the Caribbean, they had the one thing essential to the success of a revolution the control of the exit and the entry to the revolutionary area. They had the hills. They knew the river bottoms. They had running space. And they made the best use of it and got concessions over and above that that the black American could get and created especially in Jamaica, a Caribbean free man who created a class of illiterate people who could contact with the African-American free man in the 19th century. And what we have to do is to study <coughs> the civilization of the Africans away from home in that 19th century. We have to study his claim, how he claimed his own African civilization. <coughs> William Wells Brown's nonfiction, our first novelist, but study his book on Ethiopia, but study the premier African nationalist of the 19th century who started Afrocentrist, not Afrocentricity, because there's no such thing. African centricity, or it's nothing. In the middle of the 18th century, 19th century, Martin Delaney studied the life of Martin Delaney and Robert Campbell, another Jamaican. Ruswam, a Jamaican. Prince Hall, a, ba a Barbasian, who found the Masons. You found in the 19th century, you see coming together Caribbean intellects, African American intellects, claiming the African civilization. But the greatest spokesman of them all and the great scholar was Edmund Blyden from the Virgin Island. <coughs> Went out in the 1850s and found his actual African family long before Ellis Haley. Wrote a classic work still worth studying Islam, Christianity, and the Negro race. Book on African customs. Book on Palestine. Became president of Liberia College. He prophesied the whole black studies movement. 
Is the inaugural address 1881 Liberia College? Ambassador to England on two, uh, two occasions, his relatives still very much alive. I'm saying that we had 200 years of activity of claiming African civilization. And we did not compromise in making that claim. And we were very clear about who invaded Africa and what they did. And some of us were clear about something practically very few of us are clear about now, and that is the Arabs. The Arabs were slave traders before Islam. And that every foreign religion that has been come into Africa has been a rationale for slavery. I'm not so much as arguing against religion, I'm arguing